I'm Shelley Till, and welcome in to the final weekly edition of the Tri-State Report. Joining me first is Rick Kolpitz, Superintendent of Western Dubuque Schools. Hi, Rick. How are you? Good. How are you, Shelley? Doing great. Um, so I know when we first met a while back, things had just kind of started getting into virtual or distance learning. As you look back and the school year has wrapped up, how did that go for you? Uh, it went fine, I think is the strongest word I could use. You know, the fact is, is that uh, we weren't in a position to do virtual learning for all of our students, which meant we were in that uh, optional, um, optional voluntary situation. And so we had a pretty decent level of engagement with our younger kids. The older students who weren't required um, didn't spend a whole lot of time doing it. Although there were some kids, even kids that were seniors that were actually very engaged the entire time. That's, uh, that's good news. Yeah. So as you um, taking lessons that you've learned from that and have had to create a return to learn plan for next school year, what um, adjustments are you making? And, and I know particularly you have potentially some different start and end dates. Yeah, um, that was probably the biggest challenge that we faced until we got through that process was finding a calendar that we could afford and that brought the kids back as early as possible. And, and we've done that. We actually have a, uh, our teachers agreed to an additional five days of work with no extra pay for next year, which is fantastic. So um, we're converting all those in several PE days. So our students, instead of in a typical year, they would get about 178 days in front of the teachers. Um, the calendar that we're proposing will get them 189 days. So in 11 additional days, we're pretty excited about that. And that was a big hurdle to overcome as, uh, uh, the other thing that we're doing is this summer, we are actually doing during the month of June, a, a, a summer school virtual. And it was really kind of to pilot exactly what kind of stumbling blocks we'd be facing next year. And we're finding that out. It started Monday. Um, there were about 300 students at the high school level that signed up. And we actually have several of those kids that have dropped since then because they kind of thought it was going to be, you know, I don't have to really do anything and I can do what I want to. But it's a 60 day class or 60 hour class in a 20 day time period. So there's some timelines. So there are some kids that weren't meeting those expectations decided they didn't want to do it. But anyway, that's been uh, presenting us with some real opportunities to learn what it's going to look like if we're in that situation next year. And to that point, um, I know, you know, you're ready to go. You want to have kids back in the classroom, but based on what you've learned from the ending of this school year and just in talking with other districts, what kinds of things do you have in place for backup plans? Should you, even if you start in person, but should you have to go back to, uh, virtual learning if there is another outbreak? Yeah, I think there's several things for us. Um, one would be uh, transportation for us. If we're under social distancing guidelines, uh, we are the largest geographical district in the state, 555 square miles. And if you can only put 13 kids on a bus, it's probably not feasible for us with about 50 plus routes for us to have school in that environment. So we're really taking a good hard look at what it would mean if we how do we make our buses safe and put more than 13 kids on them, I guess, is the big thing. Health and safety is a big concern, too. You know, what, what it's going to look like when the kids enter school, what it's going to look like during the day, and, you know, even what lunch and PE and all those other things look like if we are in a situation where we have to make sure that we're trying to social distance as best as possible. So those are all things that the, uh, the district leadership team of our Return to Learn plan, as well as our subcommittees, are really digging into right now. We're kind of in the heart of it. We got about a 20-page document, and I'm guessing that'll be about 40 to 50 pages when it's all done. And when do you propose that you'll have, you know, things somewhat finalized in terms of what it really will look like for the fall? Well, uh, July 1st is the Return to Learn due date, um, but we don't anticipate that'll be something that's intense because it'll probably be a couple of check boxes that say you will, you will, you will, and you say yes, and you agree to. It's the plan that supports that. So we will have that plan ready to go July 1st, but the month of July will be really about, okay, so now we said we're going to do this. Now, how are we actually going to get it done and who has to do what? So that'll be really the month of July will be implementing that plan should we need to. Well, Rick, we, we appreciate you being here a couple different times and just filling us in and for everything that you've had to do to pivot to try to provide the best quality education for the youth and for your and safe environment for your teachers as well. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. 
Joining me now are Activities Directors Tom English from Wallert Catholic High School in Dubuque and Tyler Lown from Western Dubuque. Hey guys, how are you doing? Good, Charlie. How are you? Wonderful. Good to see you. Um, I know that it, this week has probably been a whirlwind and, and uh, several weeks leading up to this with the restart of baseball and softball in the state of Iowa. So just kind of give us a pulse of how things are going so far this week. Tom, we'll start with you. Well, it's been a great week. Uh, the kids and the coaches have been really, really excited about getting back and well, going out and to observe practices. It's just really fun to see them getting back at it after you know, these two or three months of not doing a whole lot of anything. And, and Eastern Iowa is a hotbed for baseball and softball. So what better sports to, to kick things off with when those put those two. And uh, we've really enjoyed uh, watching the kids uh, just get back into it and have a lot of fun playing the sports that they love. Tyler, how about in at Western Dubuque? What's the feedback been so far from your coaches and players? Very good. They've been very positive with it, just getting back into things. Uh, you know, we have a, a lot of student athletes that baseball and softball is their number one passion and just getting back out there. I think the message that a lot of them have said, they just want to start moving forward. And, and how can we do that as a community? And we've kind of put a lot of a responsibility um, back on them and giving them a lot of uh, respect to just do what we're in trust, to do what we are asking them to do daily. And I think that they're taking that as a challenge and they're embracing it so far, but uh, coaches are excited how things are going. They've had some kids that are a little sore um, that they're doing a little more than they're used to, but uh, nothing, nothing too bad. And I think they're doing a good job with social distancing is a little different at practices, but uh, I think our coaches have done a great job setting the kids up to do what's right when it comes to that. And you, you mentioned the, the reaction to these new guidelines and protocols in terms of safety. Um, I used to coach. I know that that can't be an easy thing to do, um, and, but the players understand the importance of that. So I'm just curious, um, how have they been adjusting to the safety measures that have been put out, um, not only by the state, but by your individual schools? Yeah, I think one of the big things we did is we met uh, early with all parents and athletes when we decided, hey, this is something we're going to pursue this opportunity that the governor uh, had, had provided us. And then we we're able to attend the first practice every day, just kind of going through those things with them. And, and they've done a great job from what we've seen. They kind of help each other out and, you know, they hold their hands out like, oh, we're, we're six feet apart. And they're having some fun with it, you know, um, but, but they do also know the responsibility that they have um, to help keep each other in our community safe throughout this process. Tom, how about at Waller? What's what's kind of been the pulse of and the response from from the players in terms of you know following those guidelines and the and and the coaches who have to try to kind of enforce that? Right. It starts with the coaches and, and they've done a great job. They they need to be educated first, which they took it upon themselves to to make sure they knew everything, every protocol, every step that had to be taken. And then uh communication's a big key with both parents, myself. So everybody's on the same page. Everybody knows what to expect. And then you, you go out and you try to break old habits that you've had for 15 years in terms of how to have a baseball practice or a softball practice. And, you know, what I've seen, they've been doing a really good job, the pre-planning of drills and so forth, keeping kids in smaller pods, keeping them with the same kids. Those things are pretty easy to handle because you can plan ahead. Probably the most difficult is just when there's a dead moment or a, a transition from more, one drill to the next where kids are used to just kind of congregating around they catch themselves once in a while and then they spread out. So I give them credit. They've been doing a great job of trying to remind themselves of what needs to be done. And what can you tell us about the uh, conference specific, the Mississippi Valley conference, any guidelines or anything that they have suggested that you're following that might be a little different? Uh, probably number one is for the spectators is we have the conference to limit spectators at the varsity level to three per player and coach. Um, to be reviewed again on July 1st to see how things are going. And we may increase that, who knows. But uh, the reason for that was to make sure that we started this thing, being able to control it, being able to handle it, um, decreasing the unknowns a little bit. We'll know how many are going to be in our facility and how we can keep them social distance as much as possible, be able to sanitize things a little bit easier. And, and we think our parents and, and our community will respond really well to that and understand that safety's first. That's the number one priority safety of our kids, coaches, and spectators. And so as time goes on, maybe that will loosen a little bit. We'll see. But that's probably the biggest thing that's different at the conference level. And Tyler, how does that look for Western Dubuque at, at all levels um, you know, the, of competition, both on the girls' and boys' side? Yeah, we're going to follow the three uh, tickets per athlete uh, procedure is, is the conference 
uh, starts. And then we're hoping by July one, things get a little bit better, but we just think that's the safest environment for our athletes and our community to be involved in. And, uh, you know, our whole goal is once this thing starts that we can continue to move forward through the completion of, of our season. Um, but yeah, we, we think it's the right move to make and are excited to help help with that process. Um, as you had to kind of uh, scramble and, and put together a season and, and you know, follow these guidelines and communicate, uh, what, what, what has that process been like? And even getting umpires and officials for these games uh, with a lot of them, you know, being maybe concerned about health and maybe not even wanting to come back and, and umpire. So Tom, can you just kind of give us an overview of what your last like month of your life has been like? <laughs> Yeah, I was working from home eating lunch one day when the governor came on and said, oh, you can play baseball and softball. And uh, that took us by surprise. You didn't we joke had... on your lunch? <laughs> Come to think of it. Uh, we knew it was coming at some point. We thought it was going to be two weeks later when she made that declaration. So we were in scramble mode. The, the competition date was one week earlier than we had kind of heard it was going to be through the grapevine. So long story short, way back in the early spring, we as a conference put together a schedule uh, based on what we thought was going to be the start date, procured umpires, the whole works. And then when she came on and everything was a little bit earlier, it was pretty much a mad scramble to alter our schedules, find more umps and that sort of thing. But I, cr I credit the MVC athletic directors. It's a very professional group. I think we uh, got together daily via Zoom um, at that during that first week and, and organized. But uh, I think it's all organized. We're ready to roll. I, I do credit it seems like most if not all of them are sticking with it and uh they want what's best for kids as well and, and they love baseball and softball so so far so good on that front tyler as we approach the first games um starting with june 15th i believe uh mm -hmm. just around the corner any challenges or concerns that you're uh, taking a look at once games get here yeah, and we kind of broke our communication phase up in phases. Phase one was, hey, let's just get ready to practice June 1st. What do we need to do to practice safely and, and efficiently for everybody? So we got that plan. And then phase two is, what do the games look like as far as the transportation to games? And, and how do the game environments look? You know, we're in a unique situation at Washington Buke where we, we play games at Piasta, we play games at Epworth, and we play games at Farley. So it was, you know, when we first heard we were going to play, we got with those facilities, got the practice side ready. And now we're just working on the games and figuring out those little things and just trying to communicate with parents a little bit more um, where we have some, another set of parent meetings next week where we want to really put everything out, out to them and just answer any questions they have. Um, we know that concerns come up and we just want to do that. Um, one good thing I want to piggyback off what Tom said is just, uh, you know, I, I want to shout out to the Butte County ADs. I think we've come together to work together to, to make a great environment for our student athletes where the freshman level, they're not going to have to travel with outside the county. We've, we've come together to do that for them. We've helped each other out with games. And I think it's just good to, to be in the county with three other ADs that are on the same page and want to make decisions based on what's best for our student athletes. And uh, I think that's very, very important. And I think that hopefully others can see, see how much we're on the same page moving forward. And I know you've been swamped with, uh, with this, uh, baseball and softball season but uh you know as a coach you're always looking ahead and you want to work with your athletes and so we've got football and volleyball cross country uh several other sports around the corner here for the fall um one one question i've had from a lot of people is what is if you even know you know we're used to like volleyball having those weekend tournaments where there's t potentially 10 teams and and packed gyms and football games where all kinds of people in the stands what do things look like uh, for the fall? Have you had a chance to visit that yet? Well, I think we're waiting from the governor first, and then the Department of Ed, and eventually the Iowa High School Athletic Association and the girls' union. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be a lot like the baseball-softball situation, where it's going to be a, a somewhat sudden announcement at some point as to what we're going to be doing in the fall. And I think right now it's a pretty big question mark. We as ADs have been having some discussions, nothing terribly formal, but – uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't think ahead a little bit and think, what's this going to look in a volleyball setting, in a gym? What are our capacity limits going to be? Is it going to be social distance or is it going to be half your capacity or both? Uh, a football game, same thing. Stadium full of a couple thousand people. How is that going to be handled? So you start thinking of, through a few of those things, but until we get the guidance and find out exactly what the protocols will be for fall sports, there's not a lot we can put on paper and that sort of thing. But you're always thinking ahead, like you said, the coaches are going to want to know. We can't have contact. Um, Out-of-season coaches 
can't have contact with their athletes until at least July 1st. So it's going to be crunch time. July is going to be one heck of a busy month. I'll tell you that. Well, we appreciate everything that you guys are doing to work so hard to get our athletes back playing and, and keeping everyone safe. Thanks for taking time to be here with us today. Thank you, Shelly. You bet. Coming up next is Kristen Dietzel from the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. Welcome back. I'm Shelly Till. Joining me now is Kristen Dietzel from the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. Nice to see you again, Kristen. Thanks for having me back. You bet. I feel like um, it's been a year <laughs> since yeah. we talked. <laughs> it's only been uh, a couple months, but um, yes. we wanted to bring you back on this last show just to kind of take a look back at where we've been, um, things that you've been able to accomplish, and then maybe get a look into forecasting for the future. So if you can, um, as you sure. said, talk with me today, when you look back at how this all started, I'm sure a lot of it's a whirlwind, but just take us back to the beginning and kind of your perspective as you look back with uh, 2020 vision. Yeah, absolutely. It has um, been a roller coaster, as you say, um, but I do feel like we are starting um, that we've bottomed out and that we're starting to come back up um, in our economy. So if we look back to about the second week in March is really when we started to see the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic in our area. And, you know, really with the, the governor's closures of certain businesses, such as retail, hospitality, food service, and healthcare services, that's when we, um, in our work, started to see the job losses. And, um, you know, in the previous recession, we experienced job losses over a sustained period of time. Uh, what happened in this case was a really dramatic cliff of job losses. So, um, just for some perspective, in our our county, Dubuque County, we lost 8,600 jobs in a little over a month's time, uh, which really takes us back to 16 years um, since we've had that few jobs in the county. Uh, so you look at the work that's been done over the past decades, and you see that unravel and really, really quickly in just two months time. So it's um, pretty devastating to our economy. Absolutely. And it's got to be very disheartening for you and everyone that's worked so hard to bring jobs to to be. And so with that being said, uh, what, what do you see as how quickly are we going to be able to rebound? Because we've had some major employers, Flex Steel has, has shut down, John Deere has let a lot of people go, um, and many yeah. others. So what can you give us an update as to kind of what the plan is to try and get people back into the workforce? Absolutely. So when you think about new business recruitment, um, that's not really happening right now anywhere in the country. So companies are pausing their plans if they were looking at relocations, um, if they were looking at expansions, many of those plans are on hold while companies um, try to get their feet back under them and see what the economy is going to do, see what the jobs reports are going to look like and um, see if their revenues are going to come back to those uh, pre-pandemic levels. Um, we believe we probably bottomed out in our area economically at the end of May. So that was just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the reason we say that is the new job claims for individuals who've lost their jobs um, has decreased dramatically. So we were seeing thousands of claimants a week in Dubuque County filing new unemployment claims and um, last week we had about uh, just over 200 claims. Um, for some perspective, normal would be less than 100 a week unemployment. So um, we saw that it's twice as high as normal, but that is much better picture than thousands of people claiming unemployment. Um, the other number we look at are continuing unemployment claims. And so there again, we saw those decline, which means people that had been on unemployment during this pandemic were starting to go back to work. So we think the main numbers when they come out um, might look worse than April. Um, although federally, they were surprised that the numbers are, have not been as bad as predicted. Um, but we do expect to start coming out the other side of those job losses in June and July. Now, it'll be a much slower climb out than the cliff that we fell into. I'm sure. I'm sure. 
It's like losing weight. You can gain it in a day and you got to take it forever <laughs> to lose it. <laughs> um, let's pivot to small businesses because I know that you, there've been a plethora of loans. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's still, still a little confusing. Some people have applied, oh, haven't gotten money. Some people have chosen not to apply because of certain parameters. So where are we at today in terms of what's available? Right. So um, new legislation was actually just passed on June 4th for the Paycheck Protection Program. So if you recall, this is a federal program that um, allows companies to take out loans, SBA, um, Small Business Administration loans, through their lenders, financial institutions, and most of the financial institutions here in the Dubuque area are participating in that Paycheck Protection or PPP program. Um, the idea is that employers can then use that money to pay payroll expenses. To, if they were contemplating layoffs, this would be a way to protect those jobs, so paycheck protection. Um, and then they also can use a portion of that money for other um, needs, leases, other costs that they've incurred. Um, and that program is still taking applications, um, at least through June 30th right now. So people, um, businesses have a few weeks if they have not considered that program to take a look. Um, And the reason I would say you might want to take a look now is that yesterday's legislation um, actually extended that loan period where the money could be spent and forgiven from eight weeks to 24 weeks. So that's significant, especially for employers that may have been closed during the April and May period and were worried about those eight weeks of payments. Um, It also changes the rehiring period for employees from June 30th to December 31st. So what we're seeing with this legislation is really significant flexibility for those loans to be forgiven. So I really encourage businesses of any size um, who had passed on that PPP program to take a look um, and see if the new flexibility rules uh, would provide a benefit to their business it's also available for nonprofits, so that's something that um, that's something that nonprofits should look at too. And um, businesses can certainly call our COVID nineteen business helpline um, that we run in partnership with Northeast Iowa Community College and the local SBDC office to learn more about those loans, um, as well as contact their local lenders to find out how they can participate. That's a great update. Uh, Well, in our last minute here, Kristen, where can people go if they're actively searching for a job? What are some resources you have? Yeah, so I encourage job seekers to take a look at our local job board. It's called AccessDubuqueJobs.com. It's a partnership with the Telegraph Herald. We have over 170 local businesses that participate as investors in that job board to connect job seekers to available jobs in our community. So that would be the first place to start. And then you can also find contacts on that site for more in-depth assistance with your job search. All right. Well, these are uh, all great resources and we appreciate you joining us several times throughout this entire pandemic and uh, every, uh, all your information and resources are always so very helpful and you do such a great job of clarifying it for everyone. So we appreciate everything that you're doing, everything you're going to continue to do to try to bring a vibrant economic job community to Dubuque. Yeah, we really hope we come out of this stronger. I think we have um, a great foundation and great programs to help us get there. Kristen, thanks for your time. Up Thank next, you. you bet. Up next, we have uh, leaders from the nonprofit sector. Welcome back. Joining me now is Daniil Peterson from the United Way and Josh Jasper from Resources Unite. Nice to see you again. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having us, Shelly. You bet. Daniil, I'm going to start with you. Um, I think we're like day 9,000 into 2020. That's what it feels like to everyone. It does. (laughs) It's June. Um, When you look back at when this entire pandemic started and the shutdown and just the effects overall to the Dubuque community and beyond, as you look back, just kind of give us your perspective on uh, what was going on when this all started. Um, Well, yeah, in a flash, our entire um, community and world, in essence, changed. Um, I think it took our nonprofit, I'm probably closely 
um, most closely aligned with our nonprofit network um, of human service providers here locally. And I think immediately we saw them um, kind of talk about, let's come together and figure out what are ways we're going to have to adapt uh, programming and adapt, our, adapt supports that we offer to our community. Um, I, I've been very, very proud of our nonprofits. Uh, we've I know we've met, we started to meet weekly, not knowing how long that would kind of go on, but we continue to meet weekly with these um, providers to look at ways that we can better meet our community needs and look at some systems changes. And I know Resources Unite has been a part of that as well, but I've been very proud of how um, that network has really come to the table to say, how, who's doing what, where are our gaps, what are our needs and how can we get them addressed? And Josh, what would you say uh, that you were seeing early on as the greatest need in our community? I think the greatest need has definitely been food, and that has stayed pretty constant throughout. It's evolved a little bit in regards to how people are accessing food. So to echo what Daniil is saying, it's been impressive and inspiring to see how some organizations have pivoted and recognize that not everyone's going to come to your pantry, for example. And so um, organizations are delivering food um, and just doing other things creating lunches that they didn't intend to do um, just to make sure that people had access to healthy foods. And I know in, in talking with you in the past, um, there have been a lot more people impacted by this than it's not just the, the, it, the people that are usually um, needing food or needing assistance. There's been a whole other demographic that has been impacted, maybe sometimes for the first time needing your resources. Daniil, can you talk to that and just the widespread need that we've had in the community? Yeah, I think to your point, uh, we've had some people who have never accessed services before who needed them. And um, we'll probably get to this too, but I think we're going to have another wave of those um, other needs too as they come up, as people are going back to work and trying to figure out how to navigate um, telecare questions or um, I, do, I don't have enough resources for food. Where do I go? Um, I've been really happy. We have had our 211 information and referral line that's always been available and uh, calls to that line to look for local resources have gone up about 35% here locally. Um, so even just over the last week, we had nearly 100 calls of people saying, where do I go for a specific need? Um, it can be really hard to navigate our systems when you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and once you figure some of those flows out, it helps, but um, having a place to call at least to find what an area resource could be to help you with your food needs or questions about COVID exposure or questions about um, unemployment, who do they call and who do they go to? Um, that's been a good uh, source of information, I believe. And Josh, uh, to Daniil's point, you know, a lot of businesses are reopening. Uh, a lot of people have lost their jobs and are still looking for work. Um, we are not out of this yet. And, you know, we're also in a, a really tumultuous time um, in terms of racism in our country and, and everything that's going on with protesting. And it's just, it, there's just a, a lot of uncertainty still in the air. What would you say that you're hearing and what you're seeing in our community right now as to what those needs are today? That's a big one, right? I mean, there's a lot of needs. Um, but I think I feel like that one of the many teachable moments for us at Resources Unite has been, it's really kind of reinforced the power of connection and also then the lack of connection when it exists as well. And so, so for example, throughout all this, we created a partnership with Northeast Iowa Area Agency on Aging. So they focus on serving all things senior citizens. And they reached out and said, you know, we need some help. Uh, we serve about 200, 250 seniors in the area. Would you be interested in helping us contact seniors every week and just kind of check in with them, see how they're doing, see how they're doing with food. And so part of our team does that each week where they're calling seniors, checking in, What's interesting is, is yes, we're understanding better their needs for food, but it's also reinforcing how desperate so many seniors are in regards to just that connection and just hearing someone's voice and asking, how are you doing? You know, and I'll overhear people calling in the different offices and, you know, it's five, 10 minutes and you can tell that they're just wanting to share, right? Um, the other side of that is happening as well, I think, and it's being highlighted in that we have folks in our community that continue to feel marginalized. We have folks in our community that continue to struggle um, fearing 
that maybe they shouldn't reach out for help or maybe they would be judged or, you know, not feel welcome. And so I feel like in this time, it's reinforced also just the value of us as individuals to step up and really examine, you know, what am I doing on a daily basis that helps people feel more welcome or feel more included? And sometimes that means I got to do a lot more, you know, meaning I have to check myself and like my privilege, right? Because I don't, I don't walk into a meeting or I don't go around town and not feel welcome, so to speak. And so, but the reality is, as many others do, mm-hmm. and we have some responsibility around that to, you know, what can I do to help people in that way? And on top of all of this, uh, the governor lifted uh, the moratorium on evictions uh, as of June 1st. So a lot of people are in the position now where they're going to be potentially facing homelessness. Danielle, what can you speak to in terms of resources that are available for people who are really fearing that for themselves? Um, yeah, and I, that, that's a very real fear. And we've been talking about this day since the pandemic started here locally um, was our worry. What Are we going to be prepared for this? Um, so we do have a homeless um, advisory coalition that has met here for years. So that's one um, entity that really helps uh, build and support homelessness around our area. Um, that committee also kind of helped bring some additional funding to our community through our, our um, homeless, uh, we have a homeless hotline. So that number is actually managed by Community Solutions of Eastern Iowa right now. Any provider or person can call that hotline at any point if they are homeless or um, in danger of becoming homeless. Um, there's a prioritization and supports that are available through that network. Um, and then also with some of the CARES Act funding, we were able to get additional funding for some homeless supports here locally, which, um, and then I know the, uh, the board of, of our county and um, our city has some funds available for some support. And of course, um, General Relief, which is managed through Resources Unite, is a place for um, also where people can go for individual support should they get to that level. We also work really closely with um, Iowa Legal Aid. Um, Iowa Legal Aid has been a great support and resource for those who um, are wanting to be sure, is this legal? Can they do this? Um, what are what are means that I have to fight back or to address this issue before um, I before I do get evicted and my family is homeless? So those are other resources available. Josh, what could you say to people listening here? How can they help? Uh, you know, the number one thing connected to this conversation about rent and utilities as if you know someone that's struggling with rent or utilities or things like that, to strongly encourage them to reach out now. Because what's happening already, you know, already a few people in our office this morning, and they're facing months after months of bills that they have not paid, right? And so the sooner that we can address these issues, the better, because unfortunately, if it gets too deep, it becomes more difficult to overcome. And so we really are strongly encouraging anyone that needs help with rent or utilities to please call 211, stop into our office at Resources Unite, whatever it may be to seek out assistance now. You know, it's one of those things where it's a really positive thing that, for example, you have a moratorium on rent and utilities, and now the utilities has been pushed back even further. That's a good thing. But there's also a rub to that, because if you live in poverty, if you live in the struggle, you oftentimes then create have a mindset of, well, I'm going to then pay Peter to, or rob Peter to pay Paul kind of thing because I don't have to pay rent right now, I'm gonna take care of something else. But then you wake up and it's June 15th or July 1 and your landlord's like, okay, you gotta get out or you don't have utilities or whatever it might be. And so we're very fearful right now for a lot of individuals that are just not reaching out fast enough. And so I honestly, I think the best thing you can do is encourage people that they need help to reach out now. All right. Thank you so much for being here and for everything that you're doing in our community. Josh Jasper, Danielle Peterson, nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Joining me now is City of Dubuque Housing Director Alexis Steger. Alexis, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, We were just talking about the effects of the uh, moratorium that has been lifted uh, for people facing potential eviction. What are you seeing in the community since that went to an into effect? So we haven't seen uh, many evictions that have been reported to us yet, but we do expect that we will soon. Um, The first non-pay letters will go out this week to tenants that haven't paid landlords when the landlord wants to evict. So we're going to see a lot more of that happening in in our community, and we want to be prepared to be helping people um, through that, that process. 
And so let's talk about that process. If if you, I'm one of those people and, and they're, they're listening to this right now, what do they do? So a landlord will uh, serve you a letter and it has to be a certified letter that says you have uh, three days to pay any, any uh, back rent or rent for this month. Um, if you pay in those three days, then they can't move to evict. If they, if you can't pay in those three days, then the landlord can go to court and file for your eviction. Um, you'll then receive a notice from the court that says you have a court date uh, for a trial. So you would then appear at that court date. So it's not quick. They wouldn't just come and put you out on the street. They cannot come and just lock your doors. Um, it has to go through a full process and would be, you'd be getting notifications through that process. And Alexis, is there any um, assistance available for people who might be facing this, uh, this situation? Yes, thankfully we have a state program and a local program. So the state program is to help with uh, rent and uh, the qualifications is you cannot be receiving the additional $600 from the unemployment um, addition at, that you have to have lost uh, wages in your employment due to COVID. And so the, those are the main uh, requirements for the state. And you can go online to access that one out to Iowa Finance uh, Authority's website and do a pre-qualification and then do your full application. Um, at the local level, we have a program as well that helps with rent and utilities all the way back to March uh, when COVID, we saw the COVID um, loss in hours and wages. So we have some of the similar a requirement. Uh, it is income based as well. And uh, you have to have lost at least 50% of your income um, due to COVID. And you do have to have applied for unemployment. We don't have any rules about if you're receiving the extra $600, but you have to have applied for the unemployment and at least gotten an approval or denial through, through Iowa Workforce. So Alexis, if, if someone is watching this and they just are confused, um, they're scared, uh, what uh, services or, or what do you recommend they do in terms of reaching out for some help with this? If they're not sure that uh, what they can do with their landlord, Iowa Legal Aid has a hotline just for this. And so that would be where we'd uh, have them turn to with their landlord. If uh, they feel like the landlord's moving illegally through something, we also would like to hear about it. Um, we would refer them to Iowa Legal Aid as well, but we want to hear about what's happening in the community so that we can also help the tenant because if they're getting evicted, maybe the landlord would accept payment through this program and we can get them through um, that way. So we really want to them to call the housing department, uh, email us, go out to our website and see what those things are that are available. But also contact Iowa Legal Aid if anything it doesn't seem quite right with an eviction or with their landlord. And you know, we, we are, uh, feels like two years into this whole pandemic in our, in our area. I'm sure you've seen uh, and had to deal with a lot of things. Um, you know, it's been a roller coaster to say the least. What would you say to the people of Dubuque and just uh, from your perspective, uh, what is the outlook going forward? I think we're working really well as a community. There's a lot of partners and nonprofit partners out in the community that are doing work. They have resources available. Um, try really hard to reach out and not just feel like there's no one there to help you. Um, we have a lot of things going on in the community and it is easy when you're under isolation uh, to feel like there's no one else out there that can help and that you, you're kind of alone. Uh, we're all here to help. A lot of city services, a lot of nonprofits, so um, be looking for those resources, go online, uh, make phone calls, um, even just step out and talk to a neighbor, social distancing, of course, um, and, and see what's going on uh, out in that neighborhood because there's a lot of uh, help and long-term. This isn't short-term, we're not here just for three months. Um, these are long-term programs, we're here to help um, and the funding is there right now. Um, and we're making sure that those funding streams are still available after these first, you know, very difficult months. Alexis, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate you being here and sharing that information. Up next, joining me will be Keith Ray and Molly Grover. Welcome 
back. I'm Shelly Till. Joining me now is Molly Grover and Keith Ray. Nice to see you both in your office. Yeah. Hi, Shelly. It's great to be back in the office. Yeah, nice to see you. Um, Well, uh, you know, we are in June now, finally. Uh, Businesses are starting to reopen with certain restrictions. So, Molly, I want to start with you. What is the pulse that you're hearing from the businesses and how things are going so far? Well, the first thing that we hear is certainly um, the the joy and the happiness of being able to reopen. And then that is also paired with lots of questions and lots of anxiety. We did a survey that indicated most of the businesses said they're concerned about reopening. They wanted to reopen, but making sure how they keep their customers safe, their employees safe, and um, definitely convey a, a perception of safety so that people are going to come back. So um, really toggling between those two. Glad to be reopened, but wanting to be safe on the other side too. Yeah, I'm sure. And it's, it's a fluid situation, that is for sure. Keith, um, the last time we talked, it, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty about major events and things that Dubuqueers and the, and the um, surrounding communities really look forward to in terms of, uh, you know, you've got the fireworks show and the fair and, and the Field of Dreams event. What can you give us uh, in terms of updates about some of those more major events that we usually look forward to in the summer? Well, I, you, I think you nailed it when you said it's a very fluid situation. It continues to be on a daily basis uh, yeah, as we you know, continue to uh, roll into summer once we get into June. Um, I know the, the uh, fireworks has been um, rescheduled for later in the summer. Uh, that was done a little while ago. I, the fair, as far as uh, an update, I had talked to Kevin, who is the uh, executive director out there on Monday, and that still is on. That, you know, they're still looking during that time frame, the end of uh, July. I know they're, they did have it, having some meetings to look at that and reevaluate as they see what's happened with some major fairs, and like the Jones County Fair, it just canceled all of their main stage entertainment and, and doing the basics. So they're looking at that and reevaluating. Uh, one big event that we typically have here in Dubuque is early May, it's at Torque Fest. It brings in about, on a good year, if we have good weather, bring in eight to 10,000 people during that time frame at the Butte County Fairs. Uh, that is gonna be the beginning of July. That event is on. And I think that'll be a good um, test, so to speak, uh, for you know, you know, how it goes out there and, and such. So, you know, good news is, you know, the casinos both opened up on Monday. Um, they did real well uh, the, the first week and, uh, and, and we'll see how that continues to evolve for them. Molly, can you kind of uh, piggyback on that in terms of the casinos? Cause I know that, you know, with the two of them in, in town and then you've got the museum right next to uh, the diamond Joe and just that whole area is usually so vibrant at this time of year. So what are things looking like in terms of uh, not only the casinos, casinos, but a lot of those tourist type uh, things where, where people come into Dubuque and spend their dollars? Sure, we're getting tons of phone calls and we've been working with our partners at the CVB uh, phone calls from outside the local area wanting to come to Dubuque. So that is a really encouraging sign working with our members. So the tourism industry is a huge sector of our membership the museum, the casinos, we have talked to them as Keith did, and they were thrilled to be reopened. Uh, Monday was a great day for them. I think last Sunday on the amphitheater patio down at Stonecliff, uh, they were having outdoor music by Johnny Walker, and there were people outside enjoying themselves. And I think that we're seeing an eagerness from the public to um, get out and participate in, in these activities. People want to uh, be enjoying these amenities that we have not only locally, but people who are want to come from outside the area as well. So we're seeing it, it slowly as we talk to our businesses, the casinos, the hotels, um, and of course the museum, people slowly starting to come back. Now it, it's so new, right? And, uh, you know, every day is a new day and we get through another week uh, of uh, slowly seeing it ramp up. 
U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, has been doing surveys regularly. And a couple weeks ago, the optimism of small business was uh, about reopening and the economy was at 47 percent. It's actually upticked a little bit. Uh, they're feeling more optimistic. It's just a hair over 50 percent, but that's moving in the right direction. So and I, I think you see that demonstrated here in Dubuque as well. That's great news. Any any sign of optimism we have to grasp onto, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Keith, I want to um, pivot to, I know last time we talked and everyone's really kind of looking forward to this. And I, what is the status right now in terms of the Field of Dreams game between the Cubs and the Sox? Between the Cubs and the Sox or the, the Sox and the Yankees? That was the initial. Uh, I thought they switched it to the Cubs, though. No, no, that, that was just a... a uh, internet uh, rumor that was out uh, there. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, I think the big thing with it, um, the biggest thing right now, obviously, is if the uh, the owners and the players union can come to an agreement on a season. Uh, you know, if they get that uh, uh, finalized and get it solidified, you know, I think there is a very good chance. Um, we don't know 100%, obviously, but I think that the uh, Field of Dreams game is still in play. Uh, for 2020, which would be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to look different. You know, once again, if it does happen, we have not had that confirmed also, but everything we're hearing that, you know, MLB, if they do have a season, will be without fans. Uh, but even having a game at the Field of Dreams, I did an interview yesterday, a national interview, and I, I said, you know, the thing is like with, with baseball, uh, through the uh, World War I, the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, World War II, all the unrest of the 60s and 70s and such. Major League Baseball played all the way through that, and it was something for people to turn to to kind of take their minds off of what's going on in the world. And I think that game at the Field of Dreams, when you combine those two, would be absolutely wonderful for everyone. And so we're excited about the possibility, and uh, we're hopeful that it's going to happen. And like Molly had mentioned or earlier, anything we can get from a business standpoint, just to get people around is something we're very excited about. So keep our fingers crossed. We'll see. Hopefully there's something announced here in the next, once again, the players and the owners have to come to an agreement. And then hopefully after that, within a relatively short time, there'll be an announcement about the game. My hope it is the White Sox and the Cubs, because I'm a huge Cubs fan. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. That would really draw a crowd, that's for sure. Well, you know, I don't know how much of a crowd we can have. Yeah. But a television ratings would go out of the roof, I believe. Yeah. So. Very true. Molly, I'll, I'll uh, give you the final word on what can people, if you, if you had a magic uh, wand or a, a crystal ball, what do you forecast the summer in the next maybe two to three months going into the fall looking like for local businesses? Well, we hoped to see um, that optimism and the economy and this and people out and about continuing to increase. We're working on messaging right now because that's really, really important. We're working with the county and partners at the CVB and um, all across the community on making sure that we have a positive message one that resonates, one that people can be confident in. And you'll see that um, in the coming weeks, but I think it's a message that we all can embrace. Uh, but I, I believe that we're moving in the right direction. As we continue to talk to businesses, um, it, it's slowly starting to come back. But I think as we continue to have confidence in living, coexisting in a world with COVID-19 and until there's a vaccine, um, we can uh, practice uh, social distancing and wearing masks and hand washing and learn to coexist in the world and also support the economy and be open for business. So I see it headed in the right direction, but it is a day by day process. Molly and Keith, thank you so much for joining us t today and all the other times that you've uh, been with us, as well as everything you're doing for the community. We appreciate everything that you do. Thank you, Shelley. You bet. Coming up, we're going to have our final positive note. Joining me now are Beth McGorry from St. Mark Youth Enrichment and Brian Meyer from the Boys and Girls Club of Dubuque. Nice to see you guys. It's good to see nice you. Nice to see you as well, Shelley. So I'm going to start. Uh, I know most of your stuff has been completely changed, uh, the services that you normally offer because of this COVID-19 pandemic. Brian, I want to start with you. What shifts have you had to make in terms of your services provided during this time? 
Well, clearly, like most places that are serving youth, we've had to close our doors, which is really unfortunate that we can't have the impact that we've had in the past. But we feel like we're still having a tremendous impact by serving meals. We're serving between 500 to 650 meals a day. Um, it's a hot meal Monday through Friday. And since we've started, we've served over 29,000 meals um, for the kids. It's very similar to a hot lunch program. So it's a hot meal every day. And we're one of the only ones and maybe the only one in the community that's serving actually a hot meal um, for the evening meal presently. And then in addition, um, with the school district, we are providing educational packets as well to the kids once a week. So they prepare them and we pick them up and have those at our seven sites that we're serving our meals to. How about you, Val? Uh, you, uh, 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 um, it, it's been kind of fun. We've, um, we know that the social impact of these kids is really tough and um, the connection, because that's what we base our whole world on is relationships and being connected to these kids. And we've worked really hard to connect with them on social media, reading every day to these kids. Um, I don't think I've missed a single um, day all through this whole thing, through 11 weeks, I don't think I've missed today. I've actually had to start repeating good books, um, but our team has done some beautiful packets that we've had distributed out through um, Western Dubuque and the Dubuque School District of these social emotional packs. So in there, every three, there's three times a week that they're getting them. We've served over 1200 packs of take home things. So whether there's crayons and markers in there, with homework, with also ways to cope and um, deal with stress and connect people um, throughout the community. Our work with the museum, with the Dubuque Art Challenge brought out some really great things of sharing kindness and really trying to connect with our kids and really just being there for our families. And when we connect on the phone and see them at meal pickups, we've been participating in some of the meals around town just to see our families and it's been beautiful. Ryan, what do things look like in terms of trying to get back to some sense of normalcy? What are the plans going forward for being able to, you know, get kids back? Presently, we're kind of in a holding pattern. We've been dealing and talking with other boys and girls clubs and how it's been. Our kids are a little different in uh, social distancing. Um, without tons of structure, it makes it very difficult because kids want to play basketball, be in basketball games sit around, hang out, do games and things of that nature. And it makes it very difficult for us. So right now we're kind of in a holding pattern. We've always had a summer program partnership with St. Mark, which has been wonderful. We haven't been able to, to make that work this summer. So we're really sad and frustrated that the impact that we're going to have on children this summer is certainly going to be different than what it's been in the past. But hopefully with meals and, and serving breakfast and lunches and now dinners as well, that we can have an impact that way and trying to figure out what we can do now that it's starting the summer of how we can get things into our children's hands as well. And how about on your side, Beth? You know, we got pretty lucky, I'll be really honest. We're gonna have, we get to have summer program with constraints and um, it's it's been, you know, a challenge to get to that spot. And, you know, with what Brian was saying, we have to, we're, we work with so many partners in the summer um, with space because we can't house our kids and it's not in Brian's hands to decide if we can come into their space or not and there's so many things to worry about and to um, to really put you know on the table and we were fortunate enough to end up with eight classrooms which is what we need for summer program we're going to serve less kids which makes it hard we've got families who are nervous um, they're nervous about what's going on and um, how do we keep these kids safe and we're doing the best following the CDC guidelines to make sure that these kiddos are safe. Summer program will look different. There is no question, but we are praying and hoping that we can give them an, um, an experience that they'll remember. It won't just be the 2020 summer program that was off, you know, that they're still going to get um, a lot of the great things. We really want to be able to re-educate them and re-acclimate them up to schedules. You know, they're going to go back to school after not being in school for months. And the to me, the trauma of not being able to do that and to not have the understanding of, oh, I forgot how it was to be in a classroom. I forgot how it was to even stand in line and to be respectful to my teacher. And so all of those things we get to um, teach. We've got about 80 kids coming this summer, which is far less than we've ever served, um, but we still get to make an impact with those 80 kids. And 
it is huge for us to be able to take care of them. We are so excited to see them. I can't wait. I, you know, I saw some of them at Dairy Queen and I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to actually talk to you and I'm actually sure. have a real conversation and love on you. No, um, I'm kidding. Well, we're but, glad that you're doing everything that you pivoted and shifted and we're able to provide what you did and can't wait to see those happy, smiling faces right. back in your facilities. Brian and Beth, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Shelly. Thanks, Shelly. That marks our final edition of our weekly broadcast of the Tri-State Report. If any new events or relevant information comes up, we'll be sure to bring it to you. When COVID-19 hit, we wanted to bring you the stories that were most relevant to our area. I wanna say thank you to all of our guests who were so gracious with their time, and to you, the viewers, for joining us each and every week. We hope that we were able to bring you some value. If you'd like to catch any of our past broadcasts, you can do so on the YouTube channel, Dubuque MC22. For my producer, Chris Leonard, I'm Shelley Till. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe and be well.